954-668-2510. One more time, 954-668-2510. If you're text savvy, you can text us right now to reserve your seat. You'll get the full schedule. They'll message you back with a link. You click on the link. You'll get the schedule. You can register on your mobile device. Text the letters OTA to the number 41411 right now to register immediately. Once again, text the letters OTA to the number 41411 right now to reserve your seat. Uh, Once again, they have classes during the week and the weekends. You know, if you live in Palm Beach, give us a call. You live in Broward County, live in Miami, give us a call and get your seat reserved. We have a few more seats remaining. 954-668-2510. 954 9546682510 And a lot of people out there, you know, you may have a technical approach to the markets, but you may be looking at indicators like MACD or stochastics or or moving averages. Now, Eric, why would you say, you know, people out there using indicators are getting it all wrong? Well, the reason why they're getting it all wrong is because in order to get the indication, price has to actually make a move. So by the time your moving averages cross each other to the upside or downside, and then you make a determination based on that and some other factors that it's time to buy or sell, price has already made a move. So by definition, then, you will never, in the markets, if you use technical indicators, you will never buy at the wholesale price and you will never sell at the retail price. It's impossible. There's an absolute for you because price will already have to make a move before you decide to finally get in, and the banks wouldn't do it that way. The Trader's Edge Radio Show has been brought to you by Online Trading Academy in South Florida, the brick-and-mortar school where students of all ages attend real classrooms and learn a patented rules-based strategy on how to trade stocks, options, futures, and forex with limited risk. Learn with the school's money, not yours. Learn how money is made in up, sideways, and down markets by instructors who are certified, currently trade, and are profitable. They show you what they do every day. If you're tired of losing money in your mutual funds or 401ks when the markets go down, change that. Attend a free class to see how smart trading works at Online Trading Academy. Classes in Broward and Palm Beach. Seating is limited, so call now. 954 668 2510 954 668 2510 that's 954 668 2510 The opinions expressed on the preceding sponsored program were strictly those of its hosts, guests, and callers, and not necessarily those of this station, its staff, management, or sponsors. If you suffer from excruciating back pain, do not have surgery. Call Dr. Fernando Ranella, MD, and ask him about the new ozone therapy and how it can eliminate your back pain once and for all. End your suffering today. Call Dr. Fernando Ranella, the Center for Back Pain Management, 561-819-6325. That's five. 5- 561-819-6325 or injectpainaway.com. Talk 1470, WWNN, Pompano Beach, Boca Raton, Miami, Fort Lauderdale. AM 1470, WNN, with more of what you need to know. Tune in for No Bones About It with Dr. Alvin Stein, Tuesday mornings at 11 on South Florida's Health and Wealth Network, AM 1470, WNN. So, how much did your mutual funds or 401ks lose in this last market drop? If you're sick of losing all you've gained over the years in one day, do something about it. Call Online Trading Academy in South Florida. Learn how money is made in down markets and how to protect investments. Since 1997, Online Trading Academy has taught over 100,000 students how to trade and invest online. Stocks, options, futures, forex with limited risk. Learn with the school's money, not yours. Learn from instructors who are certified, currently 
friendly trade and profitable. They show you what they do every day to make money in up, sideways, and down markets in a real classroom setting. Tired of losing money in down markets? Fix it. Attend a free class in Broward or Palm Beach to see how you can learn to trade and invest online. Online Trading Academy, South Florida. Call now, 561-674-9800. 561-674-9800. What you want to know. What you need to know. Talk 1470 WNN. The opinions expressed on the following sponsored program are strictly those of the host, guests, and callers, and not necessarily those of this station, its staff, management, or sponsors. Are you a family caregiver? Are you caregiving for someone who can no longer take care of themselves? Are you overwhelmed? This is Caregiver Solutions Info with Marsha Teal. Marsha will be hosting an hour of true stories and information, tips and updates of the latest research and necessary information in the caregiving field, focusing on you, the family caregiver. An Alzheimer's disease and dementia care expert, Marsha has 15 years of hands-on experience at Arden Courts, a leader in assisted living dementia communities here in the U.S. Marsha covers everything you need to know as a family caregiver, especially if you care for a loved one with Alzheimer's disease or other related dementia or chronic illness. If you have a friend or relative that is also a family caregiver, call them now. They won't want to miss a minute. And let them know they can watch on caregiversolutions.info. And they can listen on WNN 1470 AM in South Florida or nationally on the iHeartRadio app. Now, sit back, relax, and learn from our host, Marsha Teal, as she brings information to you that may just be the caregiving solution you need. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Caregiver Solutions Info. And you can watch us at caregiversolutions.info. And whether you're listening or whether you're watching, I'm glad you joined us. We have a great show again for you today. I'm so happy to uh, be able to talk a little bit better um, than last week with the laryngitis. It's um, getting better, um, probably get a little better and worse before it goes away. Um, someone said it was my uh, sexy, sultry voice. So, you know, it's the nighttime voice, but it's five o'clock. We're going to go with it. Um, so thank you for hanging in there with me. And uh, I got some good well wishes from um, last week. So this show is for caregivers and for professionals who want to learn more about caregiving, about the family caregiving, non-paid family caregiving. Uh, I was real happy to get a phone call um, from a professional who is a family patient advocate. And she was very um, complimentary that she learned so much so far from the show. And I was glad to get that feedback because it's important that not only caregivers um, learn and, and get good, great advice, but also for professionals that work in the field um, that come in contact with people with Alzheimer's and their caregivers. Um, it's, it's important that we understand and it's important that we have not only the sympathy but the empathy to deal with lots of issues that come with this horrible disease. So that being said, um, today is Tuesday, February 16th, 2016, and we are live from Boca Raton, Florida. I have a couple announcements to make before we bring on our guest today. I uh, want to mention to you, don't forget about the Alzheimer's Community Care Educational Conference. This is a yearly educational event held in West Palm Beach. Uh, this year is going to be March 17th and 18th, and it's at the West Palm Beach Convention Center. This is for caregivers as well as for, for professionals. Um, it's an opportunity for a day and a half to be submerged in all things Alzheimer's and dementia, meaning that you can go to small groups, you can um, go to large groups, wonderful speakers, uh, people coming in from all across the country to share their expertise, tell you about what's the latest thing going on in research on, in the field of Alzheimer's disease, uh, talking about caregivers and how to take care of yourself, lots and lots of topics. It's sort of like a caregiver solutions info show condensed into a day and a half where you can actually go and be with other caregivers and uh, meet people and 
uh, form those relationships for not only today, but for tomorrow as you're going through the process and on your journey of being a caregiver. So all you have to do to find out more information about it is go to the website alscare.org. That's A-L-Z-C-A-R-E dot org. And you'll be able to pull up that information and register right online. Also, if you have a question about something you've seen on the show or heard on the show and you'd like to ask um, more about that, maybe a specific uh, uh, comment, maybe a specific question, we started offering email to our viewers and our listeners last week. And I was happy to find that we got mail. So um, before I tell you about our mail, I want to give you the email address that you can send a question or a comment to. And if you do have a question, we'll try our hardest to answer it the following week show. So the email address is my name, Marcia, spelled M-A-R-C-I-A, dot teal, T-E-E-L-E, at Arden, A-R-D-E-N, dash, courts c-o-u-r-t-s dot com so email me anytime um, i'll get that and get the information that you're requesting and we'll help you out and and uh, follow through and and so today uh, in our email we uh, received um, a question from elaine elaine in boca raton and last week we were talking about of spouses making the transition from being a spouse to becoming a caregiver when their spouse was diagnosed with um, a form of dementia and how that transition happens um, and making that transition a little easier. So Elaine sent an email and her question was, how long does this disease last? Meaning Alzheimer's. I need to know how long my sentence is. And I was really sad when I got Elaine's email. I felt so bad for her. She feels that, you know, it's a sentence and it can feel that way uh, because Alzheimer's is a horrible disease and caregiving for someone with Alzheimer's is not easy. As a matter of fact, it's probably one of the hardest things you'll ever do. But it can be very rewarding in some ways. So, Elaine, first of all, I want to say I'm sorry your husband um, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Um, Alzheimer's, that's a, that's a kind of a, a, a tricky question. Um, how long it's going to last? It, it, it depends. Um, there's been studies and of course we have the history to back it up and, and the facts to back it up, but Alzheimer's can last anywhere from two to 20 years with the average being around 10 years. Now that's not to say that that's, uh, in stone. Nothing's black and white, especially when you're dealing with um, a disease like Alzheimer's. And it's hard to just put a a time limit on it because there's lots of things that factor into that. It depends upon the person. It depends upon when they were diagnosed. It depends upon at what age they were diagnosed. It depends upon their medical condition, what kind of medications they're taking. Depends on their physical condition. Lots of things enter into, um, you know, how long it's going to be. And and there's no way to tell also um, how the stages progress. Now, one thing we do know is that Alzheimer's disease is progressive. Um, there have been some medications that have been on the market to help slow it down. But there's nothing that really says this is going to help it. Uh, we're going to stop it because we haven't we haven't found that that magic bullet yet. But you know it's um, it's it's scary, and the scary part is not knowing what's coming next. And so there have been um, people ask me, well, how do I know you know when things change and when will they change? Again, there's no answer for that. Sometimes people um, that have the disease actually go pretty steady for a long time as far as their cognition, their cognitive level um, can remain steady for a long time. And then all of a sudden they'll drop to a new level and then they stay at that plateau for a while until they drop to another level. And so it it can become like stair steps. Now other people, they um, start up here, you know, they've been diagnosed and they're still pretty high functioning. 
And then um, a lot of caregivers tell me that they see their loved one just slowly, slowly declining, like just going downhill on a very uh, slow, slippery slope. Also, there's another way. Um, someone can be at a certain level and overnight, literally, boom, they can crash. And I've seen that happen too. So unfortunately, there's no way to tell how long it's going to last, how it's going to progress. Um, but we're here to help you through that. I, you didn't mention how old your husband, your spouse was when he was diagnosed, Elaine. But I will tell you that in general, the younger someone is diagnosed, in other words, if someone has what they call early um, onset, at an early age, early onset Alzheimer's, say in their 50s, for instance, the, um, the disease is going to progress much faster in a younger person than it will in someone who has the disease diagnosed a little bit later in life, say in their you know, 80s, um, and that's going to be slower. So that is a fact. You didn't say how old your husband is, but that um, being said, maybe that'll help you a little bit more. What I would like to say is please find a support group so you can be connected and get information and share with others that have been um, in your shoes or that are currently walking in your shoes um, because you can learn so much from a support group. And we've talked about that on the show. So if you haven't already, um, you can go to support groups and they can help you manage as your husband progresses through the different parts of the disease, the different stages. Also, please continue to listen and watch our show. Um, anything else that we can help you with, please let us know. So I uh, thank you, Elaine, for the email, um, and uh, uh, good luck to you, and uh, wish you well. Uh, take care of yourself, and let us know how we can help you, how the community can help you. There's a lot of resources out there. So today, we are going to be discussing veterans benefits, what you need to know when you're creating a plan for long-term care. Uh, that is an issue about long-term care. You know, how do I pay for it? And we're going to be discussing one particular way. So stay tuned because when we come back from commercial break, you'll be meeting two experts that are going to share information with us on this topic. We'll be right back. Arden Courts is not just a place to live. It's a place to call home. Residential living combined with quality caregiving. This is the philosophy behind Arden Courts. Communities created exclusively for individuals with Alzheimer's disease and related dementia who would benefit from a safe and structured environment. For additional information about any of the unique services Arden Courts provides, call 888 478 2410 to locate a community nearest you. Inquire about our educational seminars, resource library, or support groups, or simply feel free to ask questions you may have about Alzheimer's and related dementias. At Arden Courts, we know, we understand, and we can help because memory care is all we do. Remember, call 888 478 2410 for additional information about any of the unique services Arden Courts provides. Make First Choice your first choice for home health care. First Choice is state certified for Medicare covered services such as medical treatment and rehabilitation. Qualified health care professionals come to your home and work closely with your doctor to build a care plan designed to get you back on your feet as soon as possible. Founded and operated by registered nurses, First Choice Home Health is dedicated to providing exceptional home health care. Their highly skilled medical professionals have the knowledge and ability to provide patients quality care. Call First Choice Home Health at 561-296-2770. That's 561-296-2770. And tell them you want them as your first choice. You are listening to your host, Marsha Teal, an Alzheimer's disease and dementia care expert on caregiversolutions.info. If you have a question or wish to share a story, call into the show at 888-565-1470 and talk with Marcia. Now, back to Caregiver Solutions. Welcome back to Caregiver Solutions Info. I'm Marcia Teal, and we are going to be talking about 
veterans benefits and how veterans benefits can help our veterans that unfortunately may be um, diagnosed with a form of dementia. And to help us with that today, we are welcoming Heidi Friedman and Paul Solomon. Hello. Hello. Hi, how are you? Great. Um, Heidi is an elder law attorney and Paul is a VA benefit specialist with the elder law department. And they're here to share their expertise. Uh, They're one of our wonderful sponsors to help make this show possible. And we've invited them back to talk about this very important topic and sort of set some things straight. And, and, you know, there's a lot of myths and misconceptions out there. So that's what we want to talk about today. And Paul, I know you're the VA benefit specialist expert and and, and Heidi works with you and, and helps make it all happen. So I have a, my first question is, you know, long-term care, long-term care to help pay for someone's care uh, when they, they um, are diagnosed with um, a, a, a disease like Alzheimer's. It might not be Alzheimer's. I mean, a lot of caregivers out there are watching that aren't really dealing with dementia, but that's my specialty. Um, But in general, long-term care insurance is something that could help pay for assisted living or nursing home or home health. Um, If a person was um, fortunate enough or had the forethought to buy long-term care insurance before they were diagnosed with the the condition. So in other words, um, out there caregivers, if your loved one has already been diagnosed by the doctor of having Alzheimer's disease, you're not going to be able to get long-term care insurance because they're underwriting the insurance guidelines and underwriting, you know, it, it's not going to happen, uh, that you're going to be declined. So how do you pay for long-term care? Well, maybe your loved one is a veteran. Maybe they were in the armed services. And so we're going to talk about Maybe this would be an option. So, Paul, tell me in general the the fact that the let's say someone was in the service, and and most people know that um, at, when you retire, you can go to the VA, you can go to the VA hospital, you can go to your VA doctors, and they'll help you, you know, with medical care, and you can get medical treatment, and the VA will also pay for certain medications. But beyond that, there are uh, benefits that the VA can provide, um, not not automatically, right. and and but but possibly. So I'd like to talk about those kinds of things. That what can the VA provide for long term care, and how does someone know if their loved one who was a veteran qualifies to receive benefits? Well, fortunately, unfortunately, I came across with my own family situation where I had to find out information through the VA for my own father. Um, he did not have long-term care. He has been sick most of his life, mm-hmm. and um, he's going to be 86 years old this year. Um, but we had to figure out a plan. And um, when he was going to the local VA office to get his prescriptions, eyeglasses, and hearing aids, I said, ask about long-term care part of the VA. Right. And he got nowhere. And I did a couple phone calls and some research myself, and I got nowhere. Um, but I was fortunate enough to find some people that could help me dig through all the information that's out there. Of course, we all start online first and try and go online to va.org and try and sift through there. But it really is not a clear, concise um, description yeah, of what we need. Yeah, it's kind of confusing. And I think a lot of people have trouble with deciphering, you know, does it apply to them and confusing and maybe some of the terminology and maybe they just are not understanding. Correct. And and again, people right away say to us, oh, I think I have too much in income and too much in assets because, again, whether they went online and they really didn't dig through all the information there and they said, oh, no, it just says income is too high, so I can't qualify. So when we usually talk to families, we dig a little further and we, we get all the information from them. What's their income? Where's the income coming from? Whether it's just Social Security or a pension or if it's um, dividends or interest. Why is income important? Are the VA benefits uh, determined on a financial basis? Or, or in other words, you have to qualify financially to get these benefits, right? It's not like an automatic thing. Marsha, I'm just going to answer that if that's okay. Sure. Yes, there are financial requirements. There are... The first requirement we have to make sure is that the veterans served during wartime. Let's talk about that because 
just today. I mean, it's so funny that you all are here tonight because I had a, a daughter. Well, she wasn't a daughter. She was a niece. She came in, walked into my office, um, and she was looking for help for her uncle. And one of the questions I asked her, you know, was he a veteran? And she said, yes. And she said, what do I need to know to see if he qualifies because I know that he was in the army, but he didn't fight. And mm-hmm. I said, you need to listen to the show tonight because, <laughs> because I don't think he has to have a gun in his hand and be out on the battlefield, you know, to, to, to necessarily qualify. So tell me more about the, the time frames and what's required. Someone doesn't have to necessarily be in a war in order to qualify. No, not at all. Um, a lot of people think that. Right. You know, my father, you know, was in, in country here. They didn't go to Europe. He didn't go go anywhere out of the country. And I said, well, you know, if your, your dad was peeling potatoes in South Carolina, but there was a war going on, then he would qualify. And there were certain dates. Um, we're dealing strictly now with people that are in World War II, just because of the age, um, Korean War, and we're starting to see more Vietnam um, people coming up to us and finding out if they can qualify. Um, certain dates that we're looking at for World War II, um, the dates that the government says is December 7th, 1941 to December 31st, 1946. That was World War II. So if you were serving at least one day during wartime, 90 days of service, that's the first thing that we look at because that's a simple yes or no. Um, you could find that on a discharge papers, a DD two fourteen, which people know about. Okay. Um, but that's that's the first. So step. so so that that would be the first question because yes. if that's a no, I guess you can't go any further. That's so, correct. Okay. That is like an absolute. Right. So that's an absolute. If that that would be the first thing. Can you give those dates again, please? Yeah. World War Two is, is December seventh, nineteen forty one, to December thirty first, nineteen forty six. For the Korean War, it's June 27th, 1950 to January 31st, 1955. And again, that's a lot of what we're seeing that are coming to us. Um, Vietnam, it starts February 28th, 1961, and then it, it lasts until May 7th, 1975. But the criteria there is a little different depending upon if they were in country in Vietnam or if they were just here in the States or around the world. So it's a little different there. Okay, so now we've just debunk the myth that you know you don't have to be you know fighting um on the ground you could be like paul said you could be in the in the uh what do they call it the mess hall you could be in the mess hall peeling potatoes you could be at a desk answering the telephone Right. right you don't have to actually be fighting but the war is going on and you supported the effort by being enlisted. Correct. All right. That's good. So that's the first thing. That's the first thing. All right. Then after that, we want to make sure that either the veteran or the spouse of the veteran is in need of care. That, I mean, that's doctor driven. That's not something that we can do either. That's, that's a doctor form that's provided to us by the VA that we have to give to the doctor to make sure either the veteran and or his spouse um, needs help or assistance with one or more of their ADLs, which is the you know the activities of daily living, the bathing, dressing, toileting, transferring, and or eating. Right. Once we pass over those two hurdles, then we get into the financial piece. So, excuse me, Heidi, I want to ask a question mm-hmm. because I know as you're talking, you know, um, there are people out there that probably have the same questions I do. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I can, I can hear them and, or see them waving their hands, you know. We know, the, we know those questions. <laughs> we know those questions. <laughs> waving their hands. So I have the same question, right. um, if I don't forget what it is before I get to it. Um, the, the question is, um, when you said it's medical driven yes. and the doctor is in, involved with that, this is your is this your primary care physician or is this a VA doctor? It's your usually the doctor that knows you best. Okay. So because if you go to that's the doctor that, that will be able to fill out the form in, in the best detail. Okay. So if you're a veteran and you go to the VA and see the doctor there, he would be the one because right. that would be your primary. But some people don't use the mm-hmm. VA doctors on a day-to-day basis or, you know, for their primary. So it could be someone out in the community that 
local. So he would be the one, he or she would be the one to fill it out because they might know best. Absolutely. We've had primary physicians, we've had cardiologists or, or maybe the ones that are really treating the patient uh, or the or the veteran or their spouse. So it really, it doesn't matter. Again, it's the doctor that knows you best. Right. So you come in and they're going to go through a regular office right. visit examination, see what you can do, what you can't do, take all the medical history and information. And and something that we that we come across too, when somebody either gets denied or somebody calls us saying, you know, I wasn't um, approved, was the paperwork. There's certain paperwork that has to be filled so out. So there's a certain form the doctor's using. There's exactly. a two or three page form form that we you know give to our clients that this is the form this is it we don't need their you know two inch three inch um progress whole, notes uh, and the correct. whole file the whole medical no so when you say it could be a paperwork problem is that because maybe someone in the doctor's office didn't complete it or didn't check something off or maybe you left something out yes actually when what we always do is we have once once the paperwork is completed we want it to come back to our office we look at it to make sure it has enough detail that if it does if we do go ahead and apply we want to make sure that we're not going to get denied because listen there wasn't enough medical need there because nine times out of ten there's there's plenty of medical need it just might not be written properly on the doctor form so we want to make sure sure the form meets that criteria because yeah. that's very important too. Y yes, and and you know what's really important is the, the, getting all this information and getting it in the right place and in at the right time. And I know a lot of caregivers or a lot of adult children um, are trying to do a lot of this on their own without help. Mm -hmm. And I know that, like what you said, maybe they don't complete it all, or they or the doctor completes it, and maybe the adult child or the spouse doesn't realize that something's incomplete because they don't know what to look for. They figured the doctor filled it out, send it in, and then what'll happen, they'll get denied, right? Because That's correct. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, couple, there's a couple lines on there that we know right away that we look at. And again, if it's not specific, if it, if it doesn't say what we need it to say, based on the conversation that we just had with that adult child, then we question it. Mm -hmm. and, and again, we're not going to file an application because we know that's really, you know, everything's predicated off this doctor. Right. Form. And it's not going to be that you're, you're not going to be putting something on there that's not true no. by no means, right. but, Absolutely but there might be something that's left out um, by accident that right. would have been pertinent to the case that right. you right. don't realize. Correct. And just to let you know, if you do get denied for VA, you actually have to wait a full year before you can apply again. So really? it's not... Yeah, you really don't want to get denied on your first time, because if you if, you know if you have all the all your ducks in a row, you should not get denied. And if you do, you're waiting a year, which is a significant amount of time before you can actually apply again. And you know what? With people that have Alzheimer's and dementia, a year is a long, long time. time. It's a long you know? time. Um, and things can change quite rapidly and now you're waiting and you're not getting help that you maybe otherwise could yeah we'll hold an application for maybe an extra 30 days to make sure that it's done correct because we know holding it just this extra 30 days now will be the difference of having to wait maybe a year down the road so okay. it's worth that time to okay do it right. so now we've got so once we've done that once we've gotten you know we've got war time we've got the, the doctor. doctor the next big piece is the financial part and this is where we get a lot of people that happen to think oh i won't qualify I have too much in, in assets or my income is too high or I called the VA and they said I have too much assets. The income that the VA is looking at is not just your gross income. It's called income for VA purposes or they also call it IVAP really and truly. And what that income is, is they take the household gross income. So you and your spouse's gross income, but then they subtract your unreimbursed reoccurring medical expenses. So if you're paying out of pocket for an aid for somebody to come in, or even if you have a child that's coming in and doing care for you that you're not yet paying, but you could pay because if you didn't have that child doing it, you would have You'd to have hire to a, profe right. a professional. Mm -hmm. um, if you have those, unre uh, those reoccurring unreimbursed medical expenses, those are subtracted from your gross income to give you your IVAP or your, your, you know, income for VA purposes. Okay, so, so you're taking your income, but you're deducting some of these unreimbursed expenses. Big unreimbursed expenses. Which can be very, yes. you know, big and very large um, to get to the true 
if number a, just a simple way i mean because again if you go online and what people say there's these formulas that they try and figure out but something that we just look at very simply if somebody's income is two thousand dollars a month and that's a pension maybe and social security we have to see that they're paying out of pocket unreimbursed medical expenses over two thousand dollars a month um again using whether it's a medicare supplement that they're paying for uh, Medicare Part B, Medicare Part D. Things uh, that you might not even think about. Absolutely. Prescriptions, doctor doctor visits, again, an aide, a nurse, caregivers. If you, ha- if you have somebody in your household that's, that's caregiving, even a friend or a child, those people can get paid. So you can document those medical expenses that you would have if you were actually hiring a professional. So that's that's the first thing that we do. So we want to we want to get that IVAP down to to a negative number. Yeah, I mean, if it is if it's there, it's there. If it's there, it's there. Just have to know what questions to ask. That's correct. And assisted living too. I mean, assisted living is is considered an unreimbursed medical expense. So when somebody has this big expense of three, four, five thousand dollars a month, um, usually that's easy enough to qualify them for the income to medical expenses because we can use that. Correct. Well, that's really good to know. So. This is great stuff. I'm loving it. I know we're going to talk about there's something else, right? That, there's one that, more piece. One more piece. And we're going to keep you in suspension <laughs> until we come back from our commercial break. So stay tuned. We'll come back with the one more piece from Heidi. Do you need the advice of an elder law attorney, but perhaps find it difficult or overwhelming getting to appointments? The solution is the Elder Law Department. They bring elder law to you by meeting with you in the comfort of your own surroundings to discuss your personal situation and family needs. In practice since 1994, Heidi Friedman is a member of the Elder Law section of the Florida Bar. She and her team help families with issues that include incapacity and estate planning, asset preservation, veterans benefits, and other legal issues that seniors may face. Call the Elder Law Department at 954-383-1143. 954 383 1143. They bring elder law to you. Make First Choice your first choice for home health care. First Choice is state certified for Medicare covered services such as medical treatment and rehabilitation. Qualified health care professionals come to your home and work closely with your doctor to build a care plan designed to get you back on your feet as soon as possible. Founded and operated by registered nurses. First Choice Home Health is dedicated to providing exceptional home health care. Their highly skilled medical professionals have the knowledge and ability to provide patients quality care. Call First Choice Home Health at 561-296-2770. That's 561-296-2770. And tell them you want them as your first choice. You are listening to your host, Marsha Teal an Alzheimer's disease and dementia care expert on caregiversolutions.info. If you have a question or wish to share a story, call into the show at 888-565-1470 and talk with Marcia. Now, back to Caregiver Solutions. Hi, and we're back with Heidi Friedman and Paul Solomon from the Elder Law Department, and we're talking about VA benefits and how you qualify and what they can do for you. So before break, we talked about the first three qualifications that need to be met prior to someone being able to even apply for benefits. And we left you hanging. And so we're back with the last one. So let's let's talk about what's the last qualification is your net worth net worth net worth has to be below $80,000, not including a, a house or a car. Pretty much everything else counts for the VA. Um, Unfortunately, that's not a bright line test. That doesn't mean if you have $79,999, you're going to get approved for VA. It's just a test that's out there or a a limit that's out there that most people know about, but it's not written anything. It's more subjective. Question. question. Go ahead. When you said net worth, is that for... The veteran or for the veteran and the spouse? Veteran and the spouse. Together. It's, net worth, it's the home, the home, the household network. Together. Okay. Together. Okay. So um, once you get below $80,000, that allows the VA to then go ahead and review your application. But that's just them reviewing it. What they actually look at at that point is your net worth, the life expectancy of the veteran, 
and whether or not you have enough in your net worth to outlive your life. If you do, you're not going to get approved. And again, because it's so subjective in our world, we like to not do any application with anybody who has a net worth of over $25,000. Now, many people out there might be saying, oh, I have way more money than that. But the way the VA works is literally at this point, you can give away your assets to family, children, whatnot, and qualify the next day for the VA. So we do in our planning, we want to make sure that our client's um, net worth meets the uh, the the eligibility for a VA so that they do get approved. Okay. So um, the VA then can um, approve or deny based upon the application. And if someone gets approved, the, I think the big question that everybody wants to know is how long does it take to get approved? And I think it changes, you know, depending on certain things. But mm -hmm. in your experience, generally, how long from time that you put the application in until that you get the, the letter? It, it really does vary. And it does vary between the veteran himself and if it's a surviving spouse or the spouse of a veteran, um, how old they are. Um, so all these things come into play where we've gotten people approved as short as, as 30 to, to 45 days. Oh, really? That, yeah, that's pretty quick. It can be quick. that long or it can, mm -hmm. it can take six to nine months. Okay. Um, we usually tell people four to six months, and that's the way if, if all the information is given to us um, and there's no surprises that we usually be, we can put the application in. And again, surviving spouses, it's been taking as quick as that amount of time. So it can happen that quickly. We hear the horror stories that people that has taken a year, two years, three years, never been answered. Um, and that happens? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yes. And sometimes we can get into the middle of that and try and help them. Other times we can't. We really have to wait until somebody's denied before then we can help. Why them. would why would an application take years? Is there do you have any idea why that might be? It just gets lost in a dark hole somewhere. It could be possibly that it's being um, submitted by somebody. I'm a VA accredited attorney, so possibly that that they take that into consideration. Um, I can tell you back in the day when we I first started doing VA, it was it, it literally we would tell people anywhere from a year to 18 months before you would see approval. We used to have to get our representatives involved to make a, you know, send a letter to the VA to get our clients approved. Um, since the whole thing that happened with the VA in recent years, we're starting to see veterans being approved a lot quicker. I still have some of my surviving spouses, though, still taking, you know, nine, 10 months before they're getting approved. The problem is if somebody does not survive that amount of time. So if I put in an application for either a veteran or a surviving spouse, and they happen to pass before we get approved, it's, it, there is no retro. There is no payback. It's, it's lost. But if they're not deceased, then it is retro. retro. Their benefits are retro from the time it was. Uh, we actually did the application. application. Usually the month right after. So if we apply, like if we applied in February now, you would probably get benefits back to March. Well, that's so. really helpful for people that are really depending on the these benefits to help pay for assisted living okay. or home health or whatever. I do want to tell you one other hiccup because it is it will affect a lot of your listeners. Um, people who who apply with dementia or Alzheimer's, they will get the benefit going forward. So as soon as they're approved, they'll start getting the benefit. The problem is that the VA will require that they have a fiduciary. That fiduciary, that appointment of a fiduciary can take a year to almost 18 months before you get appointed a fiduciary. Now, during that time, you will continue or your, your, your veteran will continue to get the monthly benefit, but the back pay will take a long time to get. So is the fiduciary not automatically the spouse? No, no doesn't have to be. I mean, it's doesn't something that we have to apply for. Once we get the acceptance letter, we then go back and we have to now apply for the fiduciary. There's a background check. I mean, so who becomes fiduciary? Would it be an attorney? Would no. it be a... It, usually we do have the spouse or a child. Um, there are professional fiduciaries. Okay. If you don't have one, the VA will appoint one, which is probably the worst thing that you want to have happen. You want to be able to pick somebody that you trust. Um, again, they do extensive, if it's not the spouse, they will do an extensive background check. Um, they have a, a fiduciary person, I, 
come out and, and have a whole conference. An interview. Uh, yeah. interview. It's almost like guardianship it in is. a way. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, a lot of times, um, like you said, spouses are usually the fiduciary. But a lot of times the spouse is not capable That's of true. handling that job because maybe right. they are compromised in some way, either maybe physically or, or mentally or whatever. Right. Um, so I can understand that you want to have a responsible person in, in charge to do that. So we do get a lot of, of clients that are frustrated because, again, they, we've gotten them the benefits going forward. But, you know, there's maybe ten to $15,000 in back pay that's due to their, their their loved one and they're not getting it and it's frustrating and we've talked to you know to people in the in the office of the fiduciary and unfortunately there's a, a long wait and it's first come first serve there wow well this is really good um because i know that so many people have questions about this and um uh you know you don't know what you don't know and right. you don't know what to ask if you don't know what to ask and so um, I hope that, you know, you got a lot of your questions answered and uh, we're going to be kind of um, switching gears a little bit now because we were talking about VA benefits and long-term care. And on the flip side, there's another way for people to get long-term care, either at um, a nursing home or in assisted living, um, that let's say you're not a veteran, so they don't have that option. Mm-hmm. And it goes to Medicaid. Right. And, you know, Medicaid is complicated. um, But what I find so many times that people come to to me, to my office, and they say, do you take Medicaid? And so I say to them, well, what type of Medicaid are you looking for? And they look at me like, I I don't know what you mean. Mm -hmm. I said, there's kind of two kinds. This is how I explain it. Then we're going to get your view. But the way I explain it to people, you know, in a very simple manner, because, you know, I'm not an attorney and that's not my expertise, Mm -hmm. but I want to explain them in general that basically there's two types of Medicaid um, um, benefits. Now, Medicaid is different state to state. You know, Medicare is the same across the United States, every state, but Medicaid's different state to state. So, you know, if you're listening to this um, program and you're in a state other than Florida, it may be different in your state. But we're talking about Florida. And in Florida, I I call it the original Medicaid, which was set up uh, by the state for nursing homes. And if someone needed to have care in a nursing home and they qualified for Medicaid because they had very low income and low assets, and, and without getting into the details, just low income and low assets, and they, they qualified to, for medically to going into a nursing home, pretty much you give the nursing home your income, the pension or the Social Security, and pretty much in general the, the state would pay the balance of your bill, I mean, right. in, in general, um, just kind of a quick answer. Right. Now, that's what I call original Medicaid in a nursing home. So about maybe, what, eight, nine years ago, probably, Mm -hmm. um, there there was a program established by the state of Florida. used to be called the Diversion Program, Mm -hmm. but now they took one word and made it a whole slew of words, and now it's something like the Florida Managed Care, Statewide statewide Managed Care, care, Long-Term Care 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 (laughs) Program. I still call it Diversion. Diversion. Yeah, it's it's a mouthful, right? Right. And I don't know why they had to make it complicated. It used to be called Diversion, and now it's, you know, about 10 words long. But anyway, the state decided that, you know, they're paying a lot of money for people to be in nursing homes. Mm -hmm. Nursing homes are expensive. I mean, you know, you can pay, you know... Eight, nine, ten, twelve thousand a month, depending right. upon what nursing home you go to. Um, it's very expensive for the state to to pay for that. And they realized that maybe some people that were in nursing homes didn't have to be in a nursing home, that they didn't need that much care, that they could do fine in assisted living. So what the state did was they created this program. We shortened it, call it diversion. And basically, it's to divert someone in a nursing home into an assisted living, um, and that would save the state lots of money. Um, But unfortunately, it doesn't work the same way as it does in a nursing home. You don't get the balance of the bill paid. Basically, the um, particular assisted livings, not every assisted living participates in this program. It's a choice. You don't have to. 
Uh, but if an assisted living participates in this program, the state of Florida pays eleven to twelve hundred dollars a month usually uh, to the directly to the assisted living, and then the balance of what it costs to live there is paid by the family in right. g- general. So there's two different kinds. So when people come to me uh, and they're asking about Medicaid, the first thing we have to do is differentiate between what kind of Medicaid you're talking about, whether it's nursing home or for assisted living. Right. And and just let me just pipe in there a little bit. Yes. Um, the nursing home Medicaid program is called the Institutionalized Care Program or ICP. And you're absolutely correct. If you go into a nursing home, And 99.9% of the nursing homes in the state of Florida accept Medicaid. It's uh, the problem that you have is a lot of times the nursing homes, if you call a nursing home and you say, I'm I'm going on Medicaid, they'll tell you they don't have a Medicaid bed available. That's not exactly how it works. I mean, if you go under private pay and you get into the nursing home and you run out of money, they cannot legally kick you out based on payer source. So when you're in a nursing home, and now you qualify for Medicaid, then Medicaid will step in, and you're absolutely right. They will pay the Medicaid rate for the bed minus the individual's income, minus $105 that the individual is allowed to keep for a personal allowance. If you go to the diversion or the statewide managed care, a home and community-based waiver program is actually what it's called, if you are on that program, that program will provide services if you're at home, services such as housekeeping, some home health care, um, respite care for you know caregivers, companionship, um, transportation, meals. It will actually provide services at home to help you keep your loved one at home. Or you're correct, it will provide, it will pay for a certain portion of the assisted living facility. Now it's not always twelve hundred dollars. A lot of people have that in their mind. It pays the service portion of that bill. So if your service portion is three fifty, four fifty, because you're on a lower level of services. That's what Medicaid's going to pick up. So it depends up. where you're at residing as to what the benefit right. is. Correct. You are always going to be responsible for the room and board of the assisted living facility. Now, not all assisted living facilities accept Medicaid. Not all of them have. It's almost like an insurance. You know, not all doctors contract with all insurance companies. Well, it's the same thing for the Medicaid. So you do have to go to an assisted living facility that has contracted with Medicaid much different than in your nursing home. Exactly. So I wanted to really, you know, put that out there because people don't understand, a lot of people don't understand that there's two types of Medicaid benefit in the state of Florida. Yes. And one is for one type of, of a facility like a nursing home and one's for a community either at home or in a in assisted living. So, we, you know, you got to know, you know, which one that, you, that you're looking for. And it also depends on the level of care that a person needs, whether they Absolutely. require nursing home care or whether they, with dementia, you know, like, um, of course, Arden Course is dementia-specific assisted living. So a lot of people don't know that someone with dementia can actually be in an assisted living mm-hmm. uh, because, the, you know, it's specialized so that they get the kind of care that they want. In the old days, I think, you know, if someone had Alzheimer's, automatically, oh, nursing, nursing home. home. Right. Well, you know, 20 years ago, you know, or more than 20 years ago, that might have been the case. But, you know, Arden Courts has celebrated 20 years. And so for the last 20 years, you know, there have been specific um, communities that will um, take care of your loved one with Alzheimer's and dementia and perhaps prevent them from ever needing to go to an, a, to a nursing home. And just to tell you, the, the reason the program did start, the diversion program did start, is because the legislator did realize that people are happier in assisted living facilities or happier at home um, than entering into nursing homes. But unfortunately, when that kind of care is need, that needed, that skilled care, that more really involved 24-hour care, that's the unfortunate reality when somebody might need to be transferred to a nursing home. But you're right. People are, tend to be happier in your assisted living facilities where they're a little bit more active and, and you know, not so hospital-like. Right. And in, in you know, in our community and, and in probably, you know, most communities um, uh, for Alzheimer's, you know, you, there's hospice too. Right. So hospice can come into the assisted living just like hospice would come into your home. And that can sometimes also um, negate the fact that you needed more care and you have to go. So it just depends a case by case basis, whether it's a hospice that you're going to stay there, or whether you know you're going to go on to a nursing home because maybe the 
um, assisted living that you're at can't do certain things for you medically that a nursing home can. And, and one of the things that we come across, because this comes across us all the time when we start talking about Medicaid with families, usually the senior, you know, their eyes either swell up or they don't, they all of a sudden don't want to talk about Medicaid because they're thinking about the old way Medicaid was treated. Um, whether it was their siblings or their family, um, and we're trying to explain to them. So it was a stigma them. attached to, is what you're saying, it, that it if was, you were on Medicaid, you were treated differently, maybe not as as nice a room or services. Or just a facility in general. Like they have to go to a Medicaid facility, so they're going to go to the other side of the tracks or go somewhere right. be, to be put away, and that's totally not the case. Well, thank you for bringing that up because, you know, right. again, you don't know what you don't know, and things change. Right. It's, you know... We're being, I think we're being more progressive and, and things are changing. And that's why, you know, we're talking about this. I think it's really important. Marsha, I just want to say one more thing about the, the, the diversion program. Yes. Unfortunately, the governor and the government does not fully fund the program. So right now there is over 30,000 seniors on, that, on a wait list for a slot to be able to apply for Medicaid diversion. So it's really important on who you vote for and to get in touch with your representatives and stuff like that to, to get more funding for the program because it is such a need. You know, you're right. And, you know, I've known caregivers that have gotten their spouse on the waiting list and unfortunately they've passed away before they could even mm-hmm. get to the top of the list. So then they started maybe um, like almost triaging that where if your needs were greater, you, yes. you kind of got bumped up right. on the list a little quicker. Right. It's not a first come, first serve. It's who's at a higher risk of entering into nursing homes. Mm-hmm. And that's all based on a telephone conversation that's happened over the phone with the, the with a certain agency. Mm-hmm. So it's But it's really important to know that there is a list. I mean, there is a wait list. So you're not going to get the Medicaid diversion immediately. I, the lady that came in about her uncle... Um, she asked if we were a Medicaid. And that's how this hum- whole conversation came up. And I explained to her the difference between the two. And then I asked her about her uncle and some, uh, somewhat what his needs were. And he sounded like he needed assisted living as opposed to a nursing home, just from my asking her some questions. And so she said, well, um, yes, um, he can walk. And yes, he he doesn't really have much memory loss. And he was pretty fit. Um, but they had, you know, no money. And I said, have you applied for, for Medicaid? And she said, well, her um, cousin who lived up in Boston right. was applying for the uncle who lives in Florida. Now, my question to you is, is that a good idea? And, and how, how does, you know, can someone in Boston that doesn't know Florida Medicaid laws, how, how easy or how complicated um, and how... Um, good is that to do that for somebody in that situation? I mean, I'm sure that you've had experience with this. Yeah, I mean, it happens all the time that there's loved ones around the country that we come across and they want to help from a different state and they don't understand the rules and and the regulations of Florida and they they know maybe, maybe some of the rules and regulations of their state. So obviously it's best to have hire somebody down here in the state of Florida that knows the rules and regulations of Florida. Um, again, I mean, what, we, what we're trying to do with families is try and understand that there's benefits are, are available to a lot more people than people think. Right. And probably with the Medicaid application, similar to maybe the VA, I, I would think that it would be very detail oriented, mm-hmm. that it would be somewhat complicated with a lot of questions. And also, if you don't answer everything or you don't do it correctly, you're going to get denied just like in a VA case. Right. And not only that, a lot of people, we get a lot of people that said, oh, I gave away $14,000 or oh, we, we took $14,000 because we wanted to reduce our loved one's assets in order to qualify them for Medicaid. Well, that's great because they've heard that advice from their CPA or their tax person. So that's perfect for IRS not good for Medicaid. Under Medicaid rules and regulations, you cannot give away money. You cannot transfer anything for, uh, you know, not receiving anything in return. So there So that'll are, mess you up. Totally, totally. will mess you up. It wow. will cause penalty periods at the time you actually apply. So it's really important to have somebody that's in the state of Florida that knows how Medicaid runs in the state of Florida because there are planning tools that we can use down here that might not be able to be used where she is Absolutely. or in New York or whatnot that we can qualify somebody who has too much assets at this point 
we could still qualify them and get them the program and the, and the Medicaid that they need. Great. And before we get messed up with our um, time here, we're going to go to our last commercial break. And when we come back, we'll finish up with Heidi and Paul. Stay tuned. Do you need the advice of an elder law attorney, but perhaps find it difficult or overwhelming getting to appointments? The solution is the Elder Law Department. They bring elder law to you by meeting with you in the comfort of your own surroundings to discuss your personal situation and family needs. In practice since 1994, Heidi Friedman is a member of the Elder Law section of the Florida Bar. She and her team help families with issues that include incapacity and estate planning, asset preservation, veterans benefits, and other legal issues that seniors may face. Call the Elder Law Department at 954-383-1143. 954-383-1143. They bring elder law to you. Arden Courts is not just a place to live. It's a place to call home. Residential living combined with quality caregiving. This is the philosophy behind Arden Courts. Communities created exclusively for individuals with Alzheimer's disease and related dementia who would benefit from a safe and structured environment. For additional information about any of the unique services Arden Courts provides, call 888-478-2410 to locate a community nearest you. Inquire about our educational seminars, resource library, or support groups, or simply feel free to ask questions you may have about Alzheimer's and related dementias. At Arden Courts, we know, we understand, and we can help because memory care is all we do. Remember, call 888-478-2410 for additional information about any of the unique services Arden Courts provides. You are listening to your host, Marsha Teal, an Alzheimer's disease and dementia care expert on caregiversolutions.info. If you have a question or wish to share a story, call into the show at 888-565-1470 and talk with Marsha. Now, back to Caregiver Solutions. Hi, and we're back, and I'd like to thank our national sponsor, Art and Courts uh, Community. They are memory care only. Memory care is all they do, and Art and Courts is awesome because they care not only for the person with dementia, but also for the caregiver. They'd like to give you, as a caregiver, a free book called The 36-Hour Day. This is the fifth edition. It's absolutely free to you. All you have to do is call in to their toll-free number, which is 888 888- 478-2410, 888-478-2410. Tell them that you heard about this free book on the Caregiver Solutions Info program. They'll get it out to you. You'll get it in your hands. It's a family guide to caring for people who have Alzheimer's disease, related dementia, and memory loss. So thank you, Arden Courts, very much for that. So we're going to wrap it up with Heidi and Paul from the Elder Law Department real quick. I know we talked about VA benefits. We talked about Medicaid. Um, What if someone's in a situation where they have um, both, they have a need for both, and they might qualify for both um, possibly? What's your best quick advice for that? Well, I think we're we're unique um, because we can handle both. Um, Heidi being an accredited VA attorney and us um, working every day on Medicaid cases, um, we're juggling both at the same time. But if you don't do it together, that, you know, I mean, don't don't you need to coordinate those benefits? Correct. So because, Heidi... Absolutely. You have to coordinate because, like I said in the beginning, you can give away your money for VA, but you cannot give away for Medicaid. So while you're applying for VA because that's the benefit you usually are going to get first, you need to make sure that you're putting in the planning strategies for Medicaid as well. Right. So you got to plan for this. Got to you plan. have to coordinate it. You can't kind of just go nilly willy and do one and the other and not think about the consequences because apparently there are consequences um, that you're going to get denied or not going to get what you think you're going to get because one is going to affect the other Absolutely. is what I hear you saying. So you want to make sure that you call someone who knows what they're doing. How do they call you? They can call us at 954-383-1143. Again, 954-383-1143. Or go to our website, www.elderlawdepartment.com. All spelled out. Thank you. And thank you for coming today and sharing all of this knowledge. 
It was wonderful. Um, we will see you next week, same place, same time, with another great show for you. So stay tuned. Tell your family, tell your friends. And don't forget, in the meantime, give someone a hug. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us for this week's Caregiver Solutions with Marsha Teal. Join us next week as Marsha, who has 15 years of Alzheimer's disease and dementia care experience, brings you more needed information to help with the care of your loved one. This show can be seen again on caregiversolutions.info and questions can be left on the site, which may be used on the program to help others. See you next week for more Caregiver Solutions.